This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. After a solid two weeks off, the NFL is once again back in the sporting spotlight because this time they're heading to the NFL Scouting Combine in Indianapolis. And as you know, the Combine is primarily there to facilitate workouts for incoming prospects and stuff like that. But it's also a point in the year where we get a lot of info from reporters as they talk to teams, as teams talk to each other, and the outlook of the overall offseason gets crystallized. And obviously... That has a lot of impact on betting. We're getting better ideas of who may go first overall, what the Bears may do with that first overall pick, what they may do with Justin Fields, landing spots of key quarterbacks and other free agents. And it's going to play a a major factor in our path of trying to determine who are going to be the key contenders for the 2024 NFL season. Our job for today is, is to go through a couple of key questions that are going to impact what we could find out across the next couple of weeks. We're going to talk about the plans of some key teams across this NFL offseason and what we want to keep an eye on for the next couple of weeks and maybe try to identify spots where we want to buy now, spots we may want to buy later, or some teams we may want to look to fade in the betting markets as well. So I'm going to go through five key questions that I'm trying to answer throughout this NFL season that will impact how I view various teams that are in contention at the top end of the NFL betting market for next year. So we're going to dive into those for today and outline what it all means over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Here to dig into the key questions around this NFL offseason and outline what they could mean for the betting markets for this year. We'll dive into all that here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. We are here every Monday through Friday, breaking down the NFL. We got some F1 talk coming up tomorrow. We're going to talk betting on the combine on Wednesday as well. I'll be talking some NASCAR later on this week, of course, uh, all right here in the seat. As a reminder as well, we do have the Daily ISO with Tom Vecchio, now talking both NBA betting and Daily Fantasy. That's over on the FanDuel Research Podcast. You get that. Search for FanDuel Research Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, That is also over on FanDuel TV+. Plus. Uh, So go to FanDuel.com slash watch or download the FanDuel TV Plus app on your Amazon Fire, Apple TV, or Roku devices. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit the FanDuel app and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and Vermont. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777. Over at the ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9 with it in Indiana, 1-800-522. 4700, visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana, visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia, 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here, visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY in New York. Let's dig in now and outline the key questions impacting this NFL offseason and how they relate to the betting markets. Now, I'm going to focus primarily on the betting markets that are currently up over at FanDuel Sportsbook, which means we're not talking win totals right now. We're not talking divisional odds because those have not been posted yet. So our key talking points will evolve around teams that are going to be in play to win the Super Bowl and to, in play to win their respective conference, which does whittle things down. But 
we'll focus on the other teams later on for win totals, divisional bets, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that makes the number one question, at least for me this offseason, revolve around the Buffalo Bills because the Bills are a team that are always going to have a an open Super Bowl window because their quarterback is phenomenal and Josh Allen. When you have a quarterback as good as that, the window is always open to win the Super Bowl. But they're in a really weird spot right now because if you look at overthecap.com, the Bills are projected at $41 million over the salary cap at this time. That means they're going to have to make some key moves. And that's scary because this defense is pretty old right now with several key free agents. We don't really know what they'll do with Stephon Diggs. Everything Diggs has said sounds like he wants to be back. But, you know, there's been rumblings that maybe that's not the case or maybe the bills maybe they don't want to deal with it anymore so digs is a question mark and that impacts passing efficiency and passing efficiency is the most important predictor of who will be successful in the nfl so those are really big question marks around this team the question is whether the bills can retool on the fly and be competitive once again next year and Honestly, there were flaws this year with this team as well. There was a reason they had to make a sprint down the stretch to make the postseason. But again, with Josh Allen, the Super Bowl window is always open. Taking a look at the betting markets right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook, the Bills are currently 12 to 1 to win Super Bowl 59. And they are also uh, one of the favorites to win the AFC. They are plus 650 there. So if you wanted to buy low on the Bills, not really a good time to do so. Uh, They're still viewed very favorably. And rather than thinking, okay, is it too low? Do the question marks around the bills and where their, their situation is right now. My question is whether or not they're graded too highly. If they are graded too highly, that could mean there's value elsewhere in the AFC outright odds, the Super Bowl outright odds and stuff like that. So it'll be important to track the bills this offseason. They ranked seventh in the past defense this past year and seventh overall defensively, and they did that despite a lot of big key defensive injuries. They're going to get those injured guys back, but it's hard to see dominance on that defensive side of the football. So if they find a way to keep key players like Micah Hyde, if they can keep Stephon Diggs, that's awesome. And I will be willing to up my view of the Bills at that time. I'm just not totally, totally 100% sure that happens as of right now. And that makes me lower on the Bills entering this year, but we'll see how things play out. So the number one question for me in this offseason is what the Bills do to get cap compliant and try to retool this offseason. As of right now, I'm not super high on them uh, in in the markets, and I'm not going to be looking to buy futures on them, but I will change that tune if they're able to keep digs and get that defense get some of those key contributors back because those guys are important pieces of this offense one of the benefactors of question marks around the bills would be the bengals and the bengals big question mark is one that's already effectively been answered that's whether or not they'll be able to keep t higgins there was reporting over the the weekend that higgins will be franchise tagged which means he should be back next year Right now, the Bengals are projected for $52 million in cap space, so they should be able to bring him back and be good to go, and I think that makes them pretty dangerous. This Bengals offense last year finished 14th in overall offensive efficiency, and that was with a healthy Joe Burrow for basically only a couple of weeks. Now, they did lose Brian Callahan, their OC, but Zach Taylor is their play caller, and he is back. So they were able to grind out an efficient offense, despite the fact that they had Burrow either not healthy or out for most of last year. If you look back to 2022, the Bengals averaged 0.18 passing net expected points per drop back. That ranked sixth in the NFL that year and would have ranked seventh this year. And that is good enough to put you in contention. Now, this defense for the Bengals did fall off a cliff this past year. They ranked 26th there overall, but again, They've got a lot of salary cap space to maneuver and potentially improve things there. So the Bengals situation right now is if they re-sign T. Higgins, which it sounds like, again, they'll be able to keep him at least for next year, they should be projected for one of the most efficient offenses in the entire league. And they have the resources to make that defense better. We've seen them retool this defense on the fly in the past and add free agents there and get market improvements. 
when you've got those components, that's a team that has quite a bit of upside. Look at the Bengals right now. They're currently 7-1 to one to win the AFC, and they are 15-1 to one to win the Super Bowl. I prefer them in that market because if they can get through Mahomes and uh, get their way to the Super Bowl, I want some action on them at that point. And 15-1 to one is a pretty long number for a team with a quarterback this good who can be this efficient. They're one of the lower-ranked teams in the quarterback we can feel really, really good about. So as I look at futures markets right now, my favorite bet is the Bengals to win the Super Bowl at 15-1. to 1. Given that they should have T. Higgins back, Burrow should be back and fully healthy, and we know what this team can do when that's in place. So the Bengals, to me, the most interesting team in the futures market right now, and a team I'll be watching closely, and a team that has a lot of upside, especially if they can get that defense back to where it was back in 2022. If they can get to just that level, they could be a team that's very feisty once January and February do roll around. So that's number two for me is what the Bengals do to improve that defense, assuming they can keep T. Higgins around, see what they can do with those resources they do have that the Bills, conversely, do not have this offseason. Question number three for me, sticking in the AFC, revolves around Jim Harbaugh. Because one of the teams below the Bengals that could get efficient quarterback play is the Chargers. They are 30-1 to to win the Super Bowl. And they are 16-1 to 1 to win the AFC. That is actually longer than the Dolphins. And it makes sense because they're in a tough division. The Chargers are. They had a pretty rough year this past year. And this defense was terrible. The offense was not great either, even before the Justin Herbert injury. And there are fundamental issues with this team. And that's my question is, can Jim Harbaugh fix those fundamental issues with this Chargers team in just one offseason. The big issue to me of the Chargers are their their ground game is pitiful. It's pathetic. Um, and I know passing efficiency is more efficient than rushing efficiency, but rushing efficiency does matter. If you don't have any ground game at all, you're not going to be able to be a top flight NFL team. Now there are a lot of routes to being an efficient rushing offense. It could be because you got a good quarterback who loosens things up there. It could be because you got a good scheme. It could be because you have a good running back, good offensive line. There are a lot of routes to a good run game, whereas there are not a lot of routes to a good passing game. Uh, but I do still think it's important to have a good, efficient rushing offense. They don't have that. Other thing is they have a they have no vertical element to their passing game, despite the fact they've got a guy with a very strong arm at quarterback. The question is whether or not those two issues are fixable in one offseason. The Chargers do draft fifth, fifth overall, which means they could definitely address some of those issues right there. And they also have all their original draft picks as well. So they're going to be able to make some moves. The question is whether it's enough to help them compete in such a tough conference. Currently, my lean is to say no to that. Like, I don't think the Chargers are a team I'm looking to bet when it comes to betting the AFC or betting the Super Bowl because I know their path is very tough to get through Mahomes to overcome Allen, Burrow, Jackson, all these really good AFC quarterbacks. So as of right now, I'm not buying the Chargers, but I do want to keep a close eye on them because they've got a very good quarterback. Now, the other important part of their quarterback situation is we're probably not going to see massive fluctuations in the Chargers betting odds in the very near future. We like whereas like if you see a team sign Kirk Cousins, their betting odds may move quite a bit. With the Chargers, we're not going to see that as much. So we can afford to take a wait and see approach with this and kind of see how things play out with this Chargers offense. Do they get a field stretcher at wide receiver who can actually allow Justin Herbert to use that big arm of his? If they do, I'm gonna have a lot of interest. Can they address their run their ground game one way or another? I think that adding Greg Roman, despite his flaws as a passing in coordinator, I think those that does help them get better rushing efficiency. So I think they can become a team that I'm interested in, but they're not there yet. And I want to see it first before I decide to buy in, especially because I may not miss out on a lot if I don't buy into them right away. So the Chargers are not currently a team that I want to buy into in the futures market. But I'm open to it. I'm receptive to it if they can fix those fundamental issues with the vertical passing game and the ground game. But I do want to see it before I buy in because those issues are legitimate and very real and they're not fixed yet. So I want to see it first before I decide whether or not I want to buy into this team. That's primarily on the AFC side of things. That's where 
you know, you got to get through Mahomes. You got to get through the boogeyman at the end of the show. And that's very scary. Let's talk about the NFC, though. And the NFC is a bit more wide open. And that's why I want to talk about Kirk Cousins, because this one is more marginal, obviously. Kirk Cousins is not Joe Burrow. He's not Justin Herbert. He's not uh, Josh Allen. But most teams looking at quarterback are not in the hunt for their conference. The exception is the two teams that I think are most likely to land Kirk Cousins. And those are the Vikings and the Falcons. Both those teams had really good defenses last year, or at least good enough. Falcons were 11th overall by number fire schedule adjusted metrics. Vikings, very good against the run. Just ranked 20th overall defensively, but they seem better than that a lot of the time. They've got Brian Flores back as well, and that does help. But both these teams, the Falcons and the Vikings, had very key issues at quarterback. The Falcons had times where they looked okay offensively. They were able to move the football, get the ball in the red zone, but then it seemed like every time they got there, Desmond would throw this like back-breaking pick. And that can be overvalued. Turnover luck can be crazy, and it can work against you in a lot of ways, especially when it's a lot of high-leverage turnovers, which is what the Falcons seem to have every single time they move the football this past year. So the Falcons have pieces to be efficient. The Vikings have Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson might not be back for week one after tearing his ACL, but like he'll be in play eventually. So both these offenses have the pieces you need to be efficient. And they're also in the NFC, which I think is an advantage because you have fewer S tier quarterbacks. You have to fight through in order to get to the conference championship. So looking at the conference odds right now, the, the Vikings and the Falcons are both 20 to one to win the NFC. And that's appropriate because we have to remember that neither team is a lock to have cousins on their rosters. We can't just assume that he's there, but whichever team does have cousins will likely be at least in play to win the division. The key downside for the Vikings is that their division is very tough. Uh, Detroit will be good again. I like Jordan love a lot in green Bay and the bears Potentially getting Caleb Williams, another solid player, a pick nine. Their defense played pretty well down the stretch last year, too. So they're but they're a friskier team than they've been in years past. The Falcons don't have that issue. They're the, uh, the NFC South team with the shortest odds to win the NFC right now. They're at 20 to 1. Uh, the Buccaneers a bit behind them at 30 to 1. And then the Saints are at 32 to 1. So it's a gettable division and a gettable conference. And If the Falcons were to get Kirk Cousins, I'd be tempted to bet them to win the NFC. Again, you can win this conference. They have quality pieces on offense. I know that there are jokes about Drake London, B. John Robinson, Kyle Pitts, but like, yeah, I think that London and, and, and Robinson are legitimately very good players. The defense is workable as well. So the Falcons have upside, and that to me is the important thing here. I don't want to pull the trigger before it happens because, again, I don't think I'm going to miss out on a lot. Like, I don't think we're going to see the Falcons be shorter than, you know, like the Rams or the Packers necessarily, even if they do sign Kirk Cousins, because the possibility of Cousins is in part like, you know, 50%, 40% odds baked into this number at 20 to one. So I still think Cousins is slightly more likely to wind up back in Minnesota than heading down to Atlanta. But if we do see Cousins sign up the Falcons, I would not be shocked if I wound up betting the Falcons to win the NFC. Again, I'm not going to get ahead of this one personally because I don't know what the odds are that Cousins actually goes there. I can't know that because I'm not a reporter. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not the Falcons. I'm not the Vikings. But I have interest in them should they wind up getting Kirk Cousins. So Kirk Cousins, what he does, how it impacts the Vikings and Falcons, specifically the Falcons, the key thing I'll be keeping an eye on there as well. Now, the final question is one that seems kind of wrapped up, at least to me. And that's what the the Bears do with Justin Fields. And I think that it's going to wind up where Justin Fields does wind up being traded from the Bears at at some point in the probably very near future, potentially even as as recent as this week. And it makes sense because it's a great quarterback class. My numbers like this quarterback class a lot. Um, They get to reset the rookie contract timing. And although Justin Fields is fun, it is a fact that he has not been an efficient passer yet in the NFL across three NFL seasons. Is that all his fault? No. Like there are other factors at play for sure. But the fact is we have not seen Justin Fields be an efficient passer yet. His fifth year uh, option is due to be picked up or declined this year. So I think it makes a lot of sense for the Bears to move on. 
all signs point, at least through my eyes, to a trade. I don't care a ton about where Fields go, goes. I don't think he's going to be a guy who's going to entice me to bet a team to win the NFC or the AFC. And the Bears aren't, in my eyes yet, a true contender to win the conference or the Super Bowl yet. But you actually can bet on, uh, in a way, the route the, the Bears decide to take with this dilemma, the quote-unquote dilemma that they've got right now. If you go to FanDuel Sportsbook, in certain states, you can bet on which team will select first overall. And currently, the Bears are minus 650 to make that first overall pick at FanDuel Sportsbook. That's 87% implied odds. If the Bears trade fields, I think that implied probability is going to jump above 90%. And I don't think it's super, super likely they trade that pick either. Because NFL teams... Cindy pretty on board with Caleb Williams being the top guy in this class. The Bears, you know, passed over Patrick Mahomes once. I don't think Mah- Williams is Mahomes because nobody is. Nobody is a three-time Super Bowl um, winning quarterback, multiple-time MVP. Nobody is that yet. But you can understand the comps. You can see a lot of similarities between the two guys. I don't see a scenario in which the team picking first overall passes him up, and I don't see a situation where the Bears trade back and miss out on potentially getting a redo on the Patrick Mahomes situation. So yeah, minus 650 is a pretty boring bet. But 87% implied odds, I think, undersells how likely it is that this happens. So maybe you don't feel the need to bet this one. I'm of the mindset that value is value and minus 650. If I think it's, you know, if they think the odds it happens are above 87%, that to me is an okay bet. So personally, I am okay looking at this. The Bears pick first overall, minus 650, under the assumption they wind up trading Justin Fields in the very near future, and that could lead to um, movement in this market. And I do think that they will wind up making that first overall pick, likely taking a quarterback there and taking advantage of the advantages of a rookie contract in the NFL. So those are my five key questions entering this NFL offseason. We'll have a lot of more NFL talk throughout the time. We're actually talking uh, NFL Combine on Wednesday. Actually, the markets for uh, the Combine just went up at FanDuel Sportsbook this morning. So you can bet on 40-yard dash times and stuff like that. So we're going to break down uh, some of those those markets on Wednesday to hopefully get you to have some fun on the Scouting Combine for this year. Some more discussion around the Combine to come in the coming days. Before we wrap up for today, got to go back through recommendations here from last week on the show. Pretty brief segment here because we only had two uh, forward-looking or two week-long uh, things that we had in the show. The first one is Austin Cass. Check him out on Twitter, at Austin Cass. He is a senior editor for FanDuel Research. Had Austin on to break down EP on Match Week 26. Now, there is still one bet pending here. That is Brentford plus 170 to win. That game is today, so that one's still pending. Other recommendations were a double chance bet of Burnley and draw at minus 135 and Bukayo Saka to score or assist at minus 135. Burnley got a red card pretty early on their match with Crystal Palace and they lost that one three nil. So Crystal Palace won. That means you don't get the win on Burnley Burnley and draw. Uh, So a loss in that one with Burnley and draw. Did get a win, though, with Saka. Uh, Arsenal won that game or that match, I believe, 4-1. to one. Saka had a goal in that one. So Bukayo Saka to score or assist in minus 134 was a hit. So 1-1 one one so far for Austin with the Brentford money line still pending at plus 170. I had some NASCAR in Atlanta uh, on the Saturday race. Had Riley Herbst to win in that one. He was 12-1 to 1 at FanDuel Sportsbook, and he ran well the entire day. Herbst was basically, I thought, the second-best car behind Jesse Love. Uh, didn't get the job done, but Herbst ran really well. So I felt good about the process behind that bet. Thought that it could have won. Didn't wind up happening because Austin Hill won yet again. Um, maybe he's the... Xfinity Series boogeyman like Patrick Mahomes, but feel good about the process for betting Herbs to win, even though the results were not there. On the Cup Series side of things, had three bets. Uh, those went one and two. The win was on Ryan Blaney to top Kyle Larson at minus 112. Uh, Larson crashed, as happens at Super Speedways. It happens a lot with him. Blaney was 0.003 seconds from winning. So process was good there. Results were good. Thought that made a lot of sense. The 0.003 seconds, though, did hurt because I had Ford to win at plus 180. And, of course, Blaney drives a Ford. Daniel Suarez drives a Chevy Chevrolet, and he beat out Blaney by 0.003 seconds, the third closest finish in NASCAR Cup Series history. Doesn't get any better than that. Uh, Would have been better had Blaney won, so I guess maybe it does get better. Uh, But 
Suarez getting the win over Blaney and Kyle Busch. Really fun finish there. Really fun race overall. Other bet was Bubba Wallace to win at 21. Uh, Wallace finished fifth. He was right behind Blaney on that final lap. Gave him a little bump and then got loose. Washed up the track, finished fifth. But again, like the Herps one, I felt good about the process here. Didn't get the results. Felt good about the Ford bet too. So, you know, not the best results this weekend, but I felt good about the process. Almost got there with the results too and happy to no longer be super speedway betting as they head to Las Vegas this upcoming week. We'll talk about that uh, later on this week here on the show. That is all that we have here for today, though, on covering the spread. Want to give a big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Tomorrow we are back with you. We're going to talk some F1. I know that there is a lot of bad rap around F1 because Max Verstappen's probably going to win, but there are a lot of other markets you can bet as well. And we're going to talk to Sam Hoppin uh, to get his read on F1 betting, modeling, and his expectations coming into this year. To get that show as it goes live, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV+. Plus. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can check me out on threads at jim.sonis and find FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across Monday. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down the F1 season opener. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 